Well, good morning, Kirby. Good to see you. Good to be back. Uh, Last Sunday, I was down in Winter Park, Florida. A dear friend of mine, uh, one of my golf buddies when I was pastor there, died, and he had asked me several years ago to preach his funeral. So I went down and had the honor of doing my friend's funeral. And then the pastor there at First Baptist asked me if I would, while I was there, uh, preach for him. So, but I know you were blessed with Brother Kenny and, and the message that God gave him last week. And I, I appreciate Brother Kenny. I'm uh, beginning a new series of sermons uh, today. Actually, it's only a three sermon series, but it is a series uh, entitled Getting Home Before Dark. Uh, you can be turning with me in your Bible to Mar- Mark chapter 14. We'll get there in just a moment. Mark 14, we'll begin reading in verse 66. But when I was a child, uh, my first best friends were all cousins, and we lived way out in the country, and of course we would play until it got dark, and then sometimes even after dark. And I can remember on a number of occasions when I'd be over at my cousin's house, my parents saying to me, now, Tommy, you need to be home before dark. You ever have that told to you? Well, uh, by that, I mean a metaphor in Scripture of getting home as a believer uh, before dark. Uh, There are some preachers that I know that have lived about five years too long. (laughs) Now, we laugh about that, but you know what I mean? They lived long enough to undo in the last five years of their life what they had built in all of their ministry. They didn't get home before dark. I know deacons who were godly good men, but who lived a little bit too long and they didn't get home before dark, before they blew it morally. And never, we as we know, publicly repented. Well, there's some characters in Scripture, and the one today is Simon Peter, who blew it, blew it royally. Even though he was the number one Christian of his day, he blew it. Blew it to the extent that he even denied that he ever knew Jesus Christ. But I'm so thankful that that particular scene in the courtyard of the high priest is not the final chapter in Peter's life. That there is another chapter in that biography of Simon Peter, and it's entitled Restored. It's entitled Brought Back into Fellowship, so that he didn't die in the dark. He got home, back to God, before dark. If I ask you, who's the, who's the number one Christian in America today? <laughs> we probably wouldn't have a, 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 an answer that would suit everybody. We'd have different people. Arguably, Franklin Graham is one of the most well-known Christians of our generation, just like his father was preceding him. But if you read in the newspaper tomorrow or on somebody's blog, that Franklin Graham had denied ever knowing Jesus Christ, that would be fodder, wouldn't it not, for, for all of the blogs across the internet. I mean, that would make huge news. Well, Mark chapter 14 is kind of like that. In fact, it's very much like that, because Simon Peter would have been the leading Christian of his day. And the reason I say that is because his his confession was the greatest. He was the one that gave what we call the great confession. When Jesus is asking the question, who do men say that I am? And they answered him, some say this prophet, some say that prophet. And then Jesus made it personal and he said to Simon Peter, but Peter, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You see, that was a great confession, one of the greatest He was the leading believer because not only was his confession the greatest, but his faith was the brightest. 
Who was it that stepped out of the boat in the midst of the storm and walked on the water to Jesus? It was Simon Peter. I mean, he was a man who was known as the leading Christian. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 2, where it introduces us to the disciples and it lists their names, it says, first, Simon Peter. I used to think that when it said first, that meant that he was first in the line of apostles. But I looked up that word in the Greek language, it's the word protos, which means first not only in sense of chronology, but first in the sense of leadership and importance. And so when, the, when Matthew 10 begins to describe the apostles, he says, first, Simon Peter. So we have the greatest Christian of his generation, but we have him falling into sin. Now, I want us to read about that. You'd think it might be an isolated case that maybe there's not any others in Scripture, but I, I, I want to tell you that's not the case. You can't read through neither the Old or New Testament without bumping into backslidden believers throughout the text. Now, let me just define backsliding just for a minute because some people have the notion that to backslide means that a believer loses his salvation. Uh, no, a backslider means a Christian who falls out of the will of God and falls into sin. Now, there's a difference between a backslider and an apostate. An apostate is an unbeliever. He never has been saved. He may make profession of faith, but he's never really been saved. So he doesn't lose his salvation. He never had it to start with. Now, that's apostasy. When a person apostatizes, it means he never was truly saved. John said they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have no doubt continued with us. 1 John chapter 2. So backsliders are those who are professing believers who fall into a period of sin. Now, in Mark chapter 14, we see the event. Would you read with me there, beginning in verse 66? Now, the context here is the, the first two illegal trials during Jesus' Passion Week. The first is for, before the, uh, the high priest, the former high priest, and, uh, and uh, Caiaphas, I <laughs> couldn't get it out, and Annas, and there's two illegal trials before dawn. And so, it's in the midst of that when, when they have just accused Jesus of... Uh, uh, of, of the crimes of, of saying that he was going to uh, tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. And the atmosphere in verse 65, they began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to beat him, and to say prophesy, and the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. Now it's in that context that we read the next verse. Now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you, were all, you, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch, and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, This is one of them, but he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are the one of, one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. A second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about that, he wept. And when he thought about that, he wept. Now, some of you have already come to the conclusion, this message is not for me. <laughs> uh, preacher, you're going to talk about backsliders. I'm not a backslider. But let me just ask you this question. Has there ever been a time when you were closer to the Lord Jesus Christ than you are today? Has there ever been a time when prayer was more precious to you? Has there ever been a time when the Word of God was more alive to you? 
Has there ever been a time when your witness for Christ was more uh, forthcoming and uh, you, you weren't as reluctant to give your witness? Has there been a time like that? You know, when Jesus, uh, through, through the Apostle John, was writing to the churches of Asia, he wrote to the church at Ephesus. And, and he said, there's so many good things going on in this church at Ephesus. But he said, I've got one thing against you. You remember what that was, church? Remember what it was? What was it? He said, you have left your first love. In other words, he said, the, the thing I have to say about you is you're no longer on fire for God. You've lost the cutting edge to your faith. You may not have fallen into gross sin, but Jesus is not as precious to you as he used to be. Now, let me ask you, if that's true of you, then this message is for you. I'm, just not, I'm not preaching this message to the, to the carnal person who's out there living a life in sin. I'm talking about believers who have lost their first love. Now, what is the cause of Peter's backsliding? I think if we can determine that, then we can help to see what are the causes of our own backsliding. So let me just catalog them for you. First of all, in the cause of backsliding, I think we have to put the word pride. Peter was a prideful person. You know how I know that? Because of the way he talked. Jesus had prophesied only a few hours before this text that, that you're going to deny me. <laughs> he said to Peter, you're going to deny me before the rooster crows twice. And Peter said, Lord, you don't know me. <laughs> All the rest of these guys may deny you. But let me tell you, I'll stand with you. I'll stand for you. And Jesus reiterated that he would deny him. And Peter said, if you'll read the text in Mark, he said it adamantly. He said it strongly. He said, even if I have to go and die with you, I will do that. So Peter was a prideful man. Hey, you know, pride, uh, pride causes us to not admit our needs. Pride is a subtle suggestion of our own independence. We're saying, God, I, I, if I need you, I'll call you. But I've got the resources. I'm man enough to handle it on my own. Now, when a person is a proud person, they put a target on their back and the devil is shooting for you. I'll tell you why. Because the devil knows all about pride. Because it's pride that was the sin that caused de the devil to lose his position in heaven. All you got to do is read Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. Hey, the devil says, I'm going to ascend into heaven. <laughs> be a heavenly devil. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I'm going to ascend into heaven. I'm going to exalt my throne. The devil has a throne. I'm going to exalt my throne. Listen to this. Above the stars of God, which means the angels. The devil said, I'm going to be the number one angel. I'm going to sit on the congregation on the sides of the north. That's, a, that's a, a, a phrase of power. And then he makes this statement. The devil said this in heaven before he fell. I will be like the most high God. You see, the devil was eking with pride. He wanted to be number one. And part of Peter's problem was he was proud. He was proud. And this was the scripture say about pride. Pride goes before destruction. Let me say number two. The second, the second to cause for his uh, backsliding was not only pride, but it was prayerlessness. Prayerlessness. Jesus said to Peter, can you not wait and pray with me for one hour? Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus asked those three to come deeper into the garden with him, and then he asked them to pray for him Prayerless life will not be a life that will defeat the devil. You see, it's too late. Hear me, church. It's too late to load your gun after the enemy has shot at you. You've got to pray to be prepared. You've got to pray to be bolstered against the temptations that are going to come. That's why Jesus in the Lord's Prayer said, pray this, lead us not into temptation. But Peter, the prideful Simon Peter said, bring it on. I'm man enough to handle it. His pride 
and his prayerlessness contributed to his backsliding. The old gospel song says, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Why, church? All because we do not carry, say it with me, everything to God in prayer. Prayerlessness and pride. Let me say thirdly, uh, the third cause of his backsliding was carelessness. N- not only prayerlessness, but carelessness. You see, he was following at a distance. That's what Matthew says in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 58. It says that Peter was following from a distance. My dear friends, that's dangerous. Following from a distance. You see, what happened was Peter found himself at the wrong place, at the wrong time, with the wrong people. He was careless. He was careless, and he ended up putting himself in a position where he shouldn't have been. And my dear friend, I want you to know that the devil is looking for those believers who are simply careless in their Christian life. They're not attentive. They're not aggressive in their seeking to have a walk with Christ. You've got a target on your back. You're like that predator who's out watching the herd and he circles that herd. You know what he's looking for? He's looking for somebody who's not following their leader closely. You know who he's looking for? He's looking for that stray that wanders off here by himself. He got a little limp, you know. He's not very strong. he's, He's just, he's just fallen in a hole and he's messed himself up and he's hobbling around out there a hundred yards away from the rest of the herd. And that predator is just waiting to pounce on him and destroy him. We've got thousands of Christian, professing Christians in Memphis, Tennessee, and they're just wandering around. They're limping around. They're careless in their Christian life. You, 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 you heard Peter, didn't you? You heard him. I don't know him. And when they didn't believe him, he, he punctuated the air made it blue with his curses, made him believe it. Why, surely a follower of Christ would never talk like that. He was careless. Hey, have you ever noticed, have you ever noticed men, uh, I know women do this too, but this is a particularly applicable to men. I've just seen men who were leaders in their church, but I've seen them get with another group of men and get in a context that, you know, where nobody really knew them as a believer, and they can cuss with the best of them, say the most lewd jokes. The devil applauds. I was sitting in the cafeteria, and we called it chow hall in the Air Force. I was in the chow hall. I was a member of a little church, and we had another airman who led the singing in our church. This is a million years ago and a million miles from here. And uh, uh, it was midnight chow. Any of you ever heard of that? You go to work at midnight, well, they would would feed you a meal. I I was sitting in midnight chow eating, and my, my friend came in. He didn't see me. He was the worship leader in our church. He dropped his plate. I've never heard such foul language. My heart just sunk. My heart just sunk. That's Peter. Peter. Peter, is is that the same mouth that I heard you say just not long ago? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. God, is this the same mouth that I heard just a few hours ago say, Lord, even if you die, I'll die with you. Carelessness. Well, and then here's the last thing. Cluelessness. (laughs) He was not only careless, he was clueless. You say, what do you mean by that? I mean, he was clueless, clueless concerning the corruption of his old heart. Jeremiah was right. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately 
wicked. Have you found that to be true? I have. You know what I discovered is that when I was saved, that old flesh is still the flesh. It is. Do you know my flesh can do everything now it could before I got saved? The flesh can. It can, it can be immoral. It can cuss. It can deny the Lord. It can do all of those things. You see, there's only one language the flesh understands. And it's the language of the cross. You see, there's only one thing to do with the flesh. Let's put it on the cross. And let me tell you something. You don't have to put it on the cross. Jesus has already put it there. But I tell you what you do have to do. You do have to acknowledge that your old, old flesh has been crucified with Christ. You have to believe that by faith. You have to trust that God has done that for you positionally. You can't nail, you see, you can't nail yourself to the cross. Do you know that? Do you know that crucifixion is one of the few methods of execu execution that can't be self-inflicted? You can hang yourself, shoot yourself, poison yourself, but you can't crucify yourself. You see, in order to be crucified, somebody else has to do it for you. If we try to crucify ourselves, here's what we do. As Donald Gray Barnhouse said, first of all, we use rubber nails. <laughs> I think that's true. But, but, but here's what we do. We, we put one hand up here, and we take the other hand, and we drive that nail in. What are you going to do with this hand? I tell you what you're going to do. You're going to say, hey, folks. Hey, folks, come look at me. See how crucified I am? God says, no. No. Let me do the job. I can do a lot better job. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. You see, Peter was clueless concerning that old, corrupt, sinful flesh that was within him. He was clueless as to how corrupt it really is. And my dear friend, uh, that's part of our problem is, is it's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call when God begins to pull the curtain back and show you just how sinful your old black heart is without God. awful quiet. <laughs> Those are the causes of Peter's backsliding. Pride, prayerfulness, carelessness. You see, those are things that, that really make us clueless. We need to hear what God is saying to us through this example. The cause of backsliding. Well, let me move real quickly to the consequence. If that causes backsliding, what are the consequences of backsliding? In other words, what, what's the price? Well, let me just say, first of all, it's not that he lost his salvation. <laughs> That's good to know. He didn't lose his salvation. He wasn't saved and then lost his salvation, had to get saved again. No. The Bible says, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. John 20, 10, 28. He, he doesn't lose his salvation, but I'll tell you what he did do. He lost some very precious things. First of all, he lost the sweet presence of Jesus in his life. <laughs> if you've ever had that, you don't ever want to live without it. The sweet presence of Jesus. The fellowship with Jesus. It says he went out and wept bitterly. Can, can you try to put yourself in his shoes? We don't know where he went, do we? The Scripture doesn't say. We don't know where he spent the next several hours. But he was brooding. He was weeping. He was hurting. Have you ever done that? I have. I, I've, I've blown it before. And then I've just got off alone somewhere and said, Lord, I didn't think I could do that. Well, I didn't think I'd ever say that. Lord, I'm so sorry. 
I'm so sorry. He lost that precious presence. Number two, he lost his courage. He, He had said, I'll die with you, Lord. And here comes a little, teen, probably a teenage girl. <laughs> Not some big strapping soldier with a, <laughs> a, a, a blazing sword in his, but a little girl. Comes up to this big old fisherman and scares him to death. I saw you there. You're one of the Galileans followers. Oh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Is this the same guy that just a few hours ago said, I'll die with you? He lost his courage. And on three different occasions, he denied the Lord. He he went from drawing his sword to hiding in the shadows. He went from saying he is the son of the living God to saying, I don't know who he is. Hmm. Thirdly, he lost his witness. Right? Right? Backsliding really is not just about you and me, dear friend. It's about how the devil uses our backsliding as influence to the unbelieving world. When they see us getting on social media and cutting each other down, when they see us getting on Facebook and Twitter and whatever else we have, and, and, and saying things that are hurtful and, and, and causing disruption and division. And they say, well, if that's the way he does or she does, and they're Christians, well, no reason for me not to do that. He lost his witness. He lost his witness. You know, I love to play golf, but it's interesting. I'll be playing with a guy, been playing with him seven or eight holes, and finally he gets around to saying, what do you do? (laughs) Hey, he's been cussing up a blue streak, you know. Now, I don't cuss, but everywhere I spit, the grass dies. (laughs) And he'll just be cussing. And he'll say, hey, Bob, what do you do? I say, well, I'm a retired Baptist preacher. Oh. But this is what kills me. I'm a Baptist too. (laughs) I wish he'd say I'm a Methodist, but they always say, I'm a Baptist too, you know. It's funny, isn't it? We have one language for Monday through Saturday and another language for Sunday. We lose our composure at the softball game, at the gym, at the business meeting in the church. You see, sadly, Peter is remembered more for his failure than he is for his success. When you mention the name Simon Peter, what immediately comes to your mind? He denied the Lord. I I know good men. They're better men than I'll ever be. Better preachers. They were leaders. They had a track record of seeing churches prosper. But they didn't finish well. They had an affair or they did something unethical. And you know what they're remembered for today? They're remembered for their failure rather than their success. He lost his witness. And one other thing, real quickly, he lost his joy. I don't need to camp out there. I've already kind of touched on that. But he lost his joy. <laughs> you know, that happens, doesn't it? Uh, sin robs us of our joy. I think Peter had that in mind when years later he wrote his epistle to a persecuted church. And in chapter 1 and verse 8 he says, he, he says that, that even though you haven't seen Jesus, you love him. And then he goes on to say, that we, we, we serve him with joy unspeakable and full of glory. I think Peter never forgot what it felt like to lose his joy. You remember when David sinned and had his uh, adulterous affair with Bathsheba and then arranged the murder of her husband? You, you know the psalm that he wrote in the midst of all that, which is, by the way, one of the greatest psalms, is Psalm 51. 
And that's a great psalm for you to read. I, I, I bet you I've prayed that psalm to the Lord. No tell how many times. But here's one verse in it. Verse 10. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Have you ever prayed that to the Lord? I have. Lord, restore me to the joy. Well, let's don't stop. We, I told you we didn't want to leave him. We don't want to leave him in the courtyard. <laughs> we, want, we want to get him cured, okay? So let's look at the cure real quickly. It won't take long. The cure. The cure. The cure for backsliding. The uh, first thing I'd say is uh, Jesus pitied him. Jesus loved him unconditionally, compassionately. It said, now how, wh- wh- where do I get that? Well, I get it from that text in, 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 in Mark. Uh, I read it a while ago where Jesus turned and looked. No, I didn't because Mark doesn't carry that particular verse. Uh, John and Luke uh, and Matthew all carry this. Mark omits it. By the way, you know what Mark, you know, you know what Mark's gospel is? The scholars call it the gospel according to St. Peter. And so Mark's gospel is reflecting Simon Peter's viewpoint. It's amazing Simon Peter leaves this out. But there are other gospel writers included. And here's what it was. It says that when, when Jesus, that when Peter denied the Lord that third time, Jesus turned and looked at him. You remember that? Jesus looked at him. Now, Mark doesn't say that. I think, G, uh, I think Peter was trying to forget that look. <laughs> but Jesus looked. Now, how did Jesus look at him? I tell you what, I don't believe. I don't believe he looked at him in disgust. I don't. Because you see, that didn't surprise Jesus. It surprised Simon Peter because he didn't think he could do that. But it didn't surprise Jesus. How do I know that? Because Jesus said he was going to do it. So Jesus didn't look at him in disgust. Jesus didn't look at him as if to say, I told you so. That's what we'd do, right? Have you ever said that to your kids? I told you so. I don't think Jesus did that. I think Jesus looked at him with compassionate, loving, gracious, forgiving eyes. As if to say, Peter, I know you've blown it. But listen, son, you don't have to close this biography right here. I can help you get home before dark. Jesus pitied him. And Jesus not only pitied him, he prayed for him. Remember Luke 22? He said, Satan wants to, wants to get to you. Satan wants to destroy you. But he said, he wants to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. Isn't that a good word? I mean, I'm so thankful, and I know you are, to have people who pray for us. To have parents, <laughs> friends, family. But they'll die. Who's going to pray for you then? Jesus said, I ever live to make intercession. Jesus pitied him. Jesus Jesus prayed for him. And then here's my last point. Jesus pursued him. He pursued him after the resurrection. You remember what he said to to, to Mary there in the garden? He said, go tell the disciples that I want to meet them up in Galilee. Y'all remember that? You go tell the disciples, I'm going to meet them. And then then he made one little addition. You remember what it was? And be sure you go and tell Peter. That's exactly right. Make sure you tell Peter, I want him there. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, I want Peter to know, you may have blown it, but I still love you. And then when they all get up there, remember Peter's thinking he's, he's washed up as a preacher. So he's going to do what he does best. He's going to fish. <laughs> and how many of you know you, can't, you never backslide alone? Dad, when you backslide, you carry your whole family with you. You never backslide alone. You take people with you. He said, I'm going fishing. And about four of them said, we're going with you. And they fish all night and didn't catch a thing. Remember that? John 21 is the text if you want to look it up this afternoon. And they didn't catch anything. And then Jesus shows up and they say, he says, boys, you caught anything? (laughs) No. Try the other side. And they put the net on the other side and bring a fish in they can't count. Now, 
When they get to the shore, Jesus has an interview with, with Peter. And in that interview, he asked him three times. What did he ask him? Peter, do you love me? Remember? You can read it in John. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Let me tell you what Jesus was doing, and I'm through. Number one, he was reminding him of his failure. Everything about that scene reminded Peter. The charcoal fire, that's what, was, what, what he was doing when he denied him. He called him Simon. Simon. You see, that's, that's his old pre-conversion name. Every time Jesus uses the word Simon, he's, he's, he is convi- he, he's trying to speak a word of conviction. Peter has blown it somewhere, and so he uses his own name. So Jesus reminded him of his failure. But you know, he only reminds him of his failure just so he can rekindle his fervor. He said, if you love me, if you love me, and you say you do, if you love me, then serve me. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. You know what he's saying is? He's saying love serves. Love serves. If you love me, feed my sheep. So, he not only reminded him of his failure and rekindled his fervor, but here's the last thing. He restored his commission. Feed my sheep. Peter, I want you to know, I still got a place for you in my kingdom. And I've still got a place for you in my service. Oh, my dear friend, aren't you thankful for the grace of God? Aren't you glad God doesn't give us what we deserve, but He gives us what we need? Tommy, son, you need to be home before dark. I'm so glad Peter got home before dark. One of my favorite little YouTube things is about the uh, Special Olympics. <laughs> They're having a sprint. All the kids are lined up, little Special Olympic kids are lined up for the sprint. <laughs> and a gun goes off, and boy, they burst out of there. They're just giving it all they've got. About halfway down the track, one of the little fellows falls flat on his face can't get up. And all the other kids pass him by, but then they turn around and look, and they see him. And every one of them stopped. And they turn around and go back and pick him up. And then they do something that is amazing. I see why they call them special. Because they have so much to teach us. They lock arms, and all of them finish the race together. That's beautiful. Will you bow your head with me? I don't know where you fit into this scenario. I don't know if you can identify with Simon Peter or not. Maybe you have experienced the grace of God in your failure in the past, and you know what it's like to have your joy restored. Man, it's a wonderful thing to be recommissioned, to be assured that God's not through with you. Oh, Kirby, let me say a word to you, Kirby. Hear me, Kirby. God's not through with you. Do you hear me this morning? God's not through with you. God has a place and a plan for you. His grace is sufficient. I don't know where you are. Maybe Maybe you're like Simon Peter. You're out there. You're wandering around. Maybe you're out of fellowship with God. Boy, I can't think of a better day than today to get right with Him, to come back home, to hear Jesus give you that word of assurance that He still loves you. My dear friend, maybe we just need to join hands, pick up the fallen, lift up the broken, care for the dying. That's what the church is all about.
you're here without Jesus, in a moment we're going to extend an invitation. Our praise team will lead us. I'll be here at the front. These altars are open. We have counselors that would love to take whatever time it takes to share with you how you can have forgiveness of sin and you can be restored to a fellowship with God. If you want to join our church, we invite you to come this morning and just tell me, I want to be a part of Kirby Woods. That's all you have to say. We'll take it from there. Let's stand together. Stand together with me. Father, in these moments of invitation, be glorified, I pray. May your will be done in Jesus' name. 